Welcome, everybody, to ICT on PNC. This is our periodic podcast where we give you updates from the Insurance Council of Texas and the issues that are going on and topics that may be of interest to the PNC uh, property and casualty and insurance industry here in Texas. Our series lately has focused on the legislature and the bills that may impact the uh, the PNC industry, insurance. Uh, we've talked, kind of given an overview of what the legislative process looks like. We've uh, talked about some auto bills and today is TWIA, the Texas Wind Insurance Association. And basically what we're gonna do is go through some of the bills that are being proposed, talking about the funding, how, um, you know how TWIA should look going forward, and uh, how it how it how it was supposed to be set up in the beginning. And today, as usual, we have Albert Betts, Executive Director of the Insurance Council of Texas, and Angie Cervantes, who is the uh, Government Affairs Manager for the Insurance Council of Texas. And uh, they've been paying close attention to the legislative session uh, as the bills have been proposed, have uh, started to make their way through committees and ultimately whether or not they're voted on by the House, the Senate, and approved by the governor. I hope I got all of my um, civics uh, order correct of how things happen. Um, but uh, Albert, Angie, welcome once again. Uh, I'm just going to go ahead and hand it over to you guys, and you guys can start the conversation on our topics of TWIA. Uh, but first, I do want to mention, uh, not only do we have podcasts, we also have webinars that are monthly for uh, for our members and non-members. You can join in. And to uh, check out our website, insurancecouncil.org, uh, we have an event calendar there that mentions all of our webinars, other uh, meetings that may be of industry focus, but most importantly, the insurance, uh, the PNC Insurance Symposium that ICT will be putting on in July, and we're having that in Dallas this year, uh, July 12th through the 14th. Albert, Angie, welcome to I, P, ICT on PNC, and uh, go ahead and take it away and talk to Wea. Well, thank you, Rich. We are glad to be here, as you put it, as usual, to talk about Texas and the Texas legislature at least this time of year. Um, I think your civics grade is uh, approaching an A. We might need to drill down on a few topics, but thanks for that introduction of us. It's um, we, uh, uh, and I know we throw that acronym around a lot, Angie, assuming everybody knows what that means, but it's the Texas Windstorm Insurance Association, which is the residual market for uh, wind and hurricane coverage on the Texas coast in 14 Texas coastal counties. Uh, in a portion of Eastern Harris County. So TWIA's talked about a lot. Um, it's uh, politically, Angie, it's probably the hot potato at times of uh, property and casualty yes. insurance. I think probably for, I know as long as I've been around or exposed to the PNC industry and for sure you and before us and will be continuing after us, I'm sure. It will be here long. Well, let's put it this way. I, I've told you before, I was warned when I uh, started working with it outside of state government that um, the person who told me this said, I'll be retired. You'll still be talking about it. And when you retire, they'll still be talking about it. So TWIA uh, has existed for 52 years. It was created back in 1971 as a uh, solution for those who could not find wind hurricane coverage on the coast. So um, you're right. It is probably one or two in terms of importance, in terms of topics during any legislative session on insurance. And so this session, uh, a little different. Uh, TWIA has not dominated, uh, as we've said in our previous podcast, it's been uh, ESG uh, discussions and auto uh, insurance discussion, but TWIA is still up there. So let's talk a bit today about what's happening legislatively with uh, the windstorm program, some of the uh, concerns that the bills are attempting to address, and then some of the different ways the bills are approaching. Some of the issues with TWIA, it's, um, it, it is TWIA, I don't even know what to say. Let's start with TWIA and its funding, which typically ends up being the major point of uh, discussion, dispute, um, between sessions, let me back up a little bit here. Between sessions, uh, almost every year, Angie, the issue is about rates um, and what is a fair rate within uh, TWIA for its policyholders. 
And uh, a little background even on that, TWIA's rates or TWIA itself is not funded like a traditional insurance company. Um, TWIA is funded by its premiums. It's funded by a system set up to uh, sell uh, public securities. Uh, it's a debt, debt funded program and then funded by um, assessments on companies, property and casualty companies doing business here in Texas. Uh, those ass assessments are up to $1 billion. And then on top of that, it's then funded by reinsurance that they purchase, uh, TWIA purchases each year to fund them at least in the last few years at a one in 100 uh, PML uh, level. So TWIA is a little different. It's not like any traditional private carrier in terms of reserves uh, and investments and surplus. Um, it's, it's unique. Uh, that's probably I think the best that's an important it. point. Yeah, that's an important point that it's unique in its structure. And then, um, which I think then ties into the political aspect, it, it's also unique in that it's um, an insurer of last resort, but it's not a state agency. It's um, so we, it doesn't get general revenue. And so it's funding structure. It, it's complicated. It's a an interesting mix, I guess you could say. <laughs> Complicated is one way of putting it. You're right. It is a, uh, even at the uh, public securities funding level, um, it is a series of classes, class one, class two, class three. Mixed in there is a, a series of class one, class two, class three member assessments. So um, we don't have a chart. If I try to describe it, I think it'll confuse everybody listening. So short version is somewhere in there, TWIA through its, its whatever funds it has available, uh, plus the sale of bonds, uh, will come up with a billion dollars to pay losses. The industry will come up with a billion dollars through assessments against companies. And by the way, those assessments aren't recoupable through surcharges or premium tax credits, uh, and then the reinsurance program. So the background, the funding itself, there, we could probably do an hour on how we got here because it has changed. Uh, through multiple sessions of funding. Uh, at one point, member companies were subject to unlimited assessments, um, but those assessments uh, could be taken or recouped as premium tax credits. Uh, and that was changed a few years ago. So TWIA has been through a lot. Uh, thankfully, we have not in Texas had a hurricane uh, since Harvey back in 2017. Um, and so it's it's, given TWIA a chance, an opportunity to at least build up a little bit of their reserve funding. But let's, let's talk about what the ledge is looking at the session, at least what we thought coming in they would be looking at and what's actually actually happened. Uh, right. So I'll let you talk a bit about uh, pre-session. Pre-session, yes. I think that going into it, um, the industry itself had been having discussions on potential ways to fund TWIA. Uh, and we thought that funding would be a big thing. As Albert said, during the interim, of course, rates are always the topic. But from the industry point of view, funding is just really something that we wanted to look at because um, as Albert was talking about the bonds and the different levels, TWIA really, their, their current funding relies on debt. So we have been very lucky that we have not had a hurricane and um, that there is some reserves building up but um, their current funding relies on debt and they have to pay interest on that. And so it puts pressure on everything. So during the interim, um, we were working and the, the trade groups were working and um, there was lots of meetings being had on what could be a different potential solution to funding TWIA that would not rely on so heavily on debt, something more sustainable. Correct. And that debt, um, just a quick background on that, even even to sell those securities, it costs TWIA $8 to $10 million each time they have to issue one. Um, and so it's costly. At the, I think the interest rate, or at least the payback rate on the debt when they uh, uh, secured those years ago was 8.25%, would probably be higher today if they had to do that. So short version was just TWIA had um, a funding system that actually cost them quite a bit. Uh, of money. So we thought there could be some opportunity to, you know, find some solutions to that, find different ways to fund TWIA. 
Uh, I think key to that was protecting or at least making sure the industry's uh, contingent commitment did not uh, go above the current $1 billion level. Um, and against that, the pressure of not, at least some coastal representatives and, and groups, not to increase rates for TWIA. So uh, coming into session, I think the thought was find a way that uh, maybe uh, get some funding from the state. You know, we had a huge surplus heading into the session. Uh, perhaps some of that money could be committed to help TWIA build up its funding uh, reserves uh, or looking at other ways to even consider some sort of statewide uh, contingent surcharge, which would be on property uh, policies and would be at uh, either a percentage uh, per policy or some flat dollar amount. I think the thought was, was some percentage per policy, which would not be um, a significant dollar amount if you spread that dollar amount uh, total across the state. Uh, but obviously politically, as you could imagine, uh, if you're not sitting on the coast, you're, you're probably asking why, why, uh, why pay for uh, that funding? And if you're sitting on the coast, you're saying, hey, this is a state statewide issue because um, if the coast is damaged or can't function economically, it's going to impact the rest of the state. And we heard a lot from officials down along the coast pointing out the economic impact and the economic support that the coast provides for the rest of the state of Texas through our through their port systems, through the tourism, uh, through the industries that are located along the coast. So uh, a lot of political interests in finding a solution. Um, we have, like I said, been lucky that uh, what's happened in Louisiana the last couple of years with um, two or three hurricanes going through that they have not come here, but definitely needed to find some way to fix this. And so I, I know one of the thoughts, Andy, that you touched on was to um, have that state funding, but also have that contingency surcharge, but also have the industry's billion dollar assessment commitment still there. Uh, and then the reinsurance on top of that. And, uh, we don't know what's going to happen with it as we're speaking. Um, I think the bill that proposes a funding structure like this, House Bill 1588, uh, will be heard uh, in the next couple of days or so. But it'll be interesting to see where that where that heads. Yes, it will. Um, the discussion will be had, and we'll hear from, as you said, the different sides. I think. It is a it's complicated and you have to find a balance between the the coastal and the inland. Um, so right. it, it, it will be interesting to see how that discussion plays out on Tuesday. It will be. And we've actually got I know we saw in the Appropriations Act uh, bill, House Bill 1, which is the bill that says how the state will fund itself for the next two years. There was a, a contingency appropriation, I think back in Article 11. Um, that referenced uh, potentially a contingency uh, appropriation of, uh, I want to say $750 million, if I recall correctly, uh, in that bill. But again, that's a contingency and it wasn't tied to any particular uh, legislative decision. Uh, so we'll kind of see where that heads. But, you know, if that, for some reason, the concept of 1588 doesn't, uh, doesn't work or, or uh, is not supported, um, I think, you know, obviously there will be an attempt to find other ways to help fund TWIA, um, give them some money, set up some, let's just say some way that they can uh, get some sort of uh, support from the state, whether that's through a loan um, uh, from uh, the rainy day fund or through some other state funding to allow them to at least build up their uh, initial level of funding and again, get rid of the debt um, structure that's in place right now. So it remains a, a wait and see proposition. Uh, there's some other ideas out there to, to fund TWIA or to change the TWIA and its structure. Uh, and I'll let you talk about some of those details, Andy, but that, that ranges from changing the board makeup. Um, and then there's some proposals to decrease the insurance company representation on that board. Uh, there's even a proposal that would have no uh, I guess it is a decrease. It would have no insurance companies on that <laughs> yes. board. Uh, but uh, uh, a decrease remember, to zero. 
a decrease to zero. So if you remember your history lesson, it would literally be uh, assessment without, I'll paraphrase here, assessment without representation, uh, at least in one of the bills that's out there. Uh, Senate Bill 1217, I put, if I have the number correct. So uh, a lot to, uh, to ponder. Um, there's proposals to change the PML from one in 100 down to one in 50 years, um, which is interesting in and of itself. Uh, admittedly, TWIA hadn't had a storm since, like I said, 2017, thankfully, but um, I know as, as we all, as we watch and keep track of hurricanes and tornadoes and everything else that's happening, um, you know, the storms, uh, when they come ashore, they're bigger now. Uh, and they're stronger and the devastation just seems to be more in the last few years. So uh, I don't know how much I think that one is. is. And I think that that one is pretty relevant too, just because of what was going on um, with TWIA on the TWIA board in during the interim and that's continuing, I guess, on through this month when they're having a meeting. Um, we haven't even talked about assessment, the current funding structure, how it provides for assessments. Um, to member insurers for reinsurance purchased over the PML. Um, and so during the interim, the board, or this, this I guess this last meeting, the board uh, set a PML that was um, lower than what was recommended by uh, their, their consultants that do the models. And um, then uh, allowed for the purchase of reinsurance up to the higher number of um, the higher PML. So essentially it, it's almost a floor and then uh, members would have to get assessed to pay for the difference. Am I explaining this correctly? Because it's complicated. <laughs> no, I think that's that's a good explanation. Yeah, it's uh, from a law that passed back in 2019 that made companies responsible for uh, using air quotes, excess reinsurance. Uh, so I think when it when that law passed, I know the industry was wondering what did that what could that mean, um, and when would TWIA actually buy uh, excess reinsurance above their one in one hundred? So yeah, I think you described it pretty accurately. It was a recommendation to go to one level for one in one hundred, not only by the uh, Aon, their their cat, catastrophe modeler uh, consultant, but also by their own. Uh, Actuarial and Underwriting Committee, um, which also recommended a one in 100 at, I believe, 5.2 billion, if I recall the number correctly. Uh, and so, yeah, it was interesting to watch the discussion uh, and then the vote to adopt a one in 100 at a lower level, um, but then say, but by reinsurance, or at least, um, as I understand the motion that came out, uh, directed the staff and uh, others to look at uh, buying reinsurance at the one in 100 recommended level, which would have meant uh, an additional $700 million of reinsurance that the industry would be responsible for paying for. Uh, and the mechanics of that, I probably get confusing to try to describe it. I think everyone's trying to figure out the mechanics of it. Um, you know, we will not, or TWIA will not know the price of that reinsurance till uh, typically until June or late May. Um, and then would there be an assessment on the industry to pay whatever that price difference is? How would it be priced? Um, and if, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, I think the discussion was uh, TWIA will get a quote at the approved, board approved 1 in 100 PML, and then get another quote for the additional. 700 million in uh, reinsurance. So, correct. Uh, yeah. Okay. So, you have this, yes, yeah, so you have this playing out. And then um, I think that the bill, one of the, the bills that discusses this Senate Bill 1217, that also has a lot of other components to it, does contemplate, I guess, that requiring TWIA to pick the lowest PML always. And then it's also the bill that requires lowering the PML. So, it that's something to watch just to see how that plays out with with the reinsurance statute and what happens with that. Yeah, and uh, the best part of 1217, besides, I'm sure to our listeners, our industry listeners, besides no uh, no board members from the insurance industry or the company in, uh, side of it, 
is to then have assessments to pay for. Uh, it looks like anything above whatever the reinsurance level is. Um, also, the way the bill is written, it appears to make other losses subject to member assessment. So uh, I know uh, there, at some point, if there's a hearing on the bill, we'll clarify that, but that bill did seem to create a, a layer of unlimited assessments on insurance With companies. The, that were subject to the CPI as well. That's correct. Yeah, subject to the CPI uh, at each level of, um, of um, assessment, because it looks like it kept class one, class two, class three, assessments, which we referenced earlier. Uh, subject those to CPI, so it's definitely going to be above a billion for that, and then unlimited to pay above whatever the reinsurance purchase amount is. So uh, a lot of moving parts in that bill. Um, some other quick changes, it, it would move TWIA down to uh, Tier 1 uh, areas on the coast or Tier 2, and it would make the insurance commissioner responsible for selecting the TWIA general manager. Uh, and as the bill is written, the insurance commissioner could also remove the TWIA general manager. So a lot of structural changes there to TWIA and a uh, big concern for the industry just from the standpoint of the unlimited assessments, because uh, it is a cost of doing business here in Texas uh, that you have that money set aside to help pay storms. Uh, after a loss. And I think the last assessment we had was after Harvey, and it was $372 million, as I recall. Um, TWIA's total losses were, were at $1.8 billion. Um, um, so, um, you know, and remember Harvey, the industry paid $9 billion in other losses uh, just from auto and, and home damage during that storm. So it's a big commitment by the industry. And I think something people need to keep in mind, and I say people, but obviously mm -hmm. uh, the public and legislature needs to be aware of to understand. Um, uh, not only does the industry write the majority of the wind and hurricane coverage on the coast, in addition to auto and, uh, and other coverages, uh, but we also have a substantial commitment to the coast uh, financially beyond uh, our own coverages and our own exposure. So it's, um, here's a big deal, let's just put it politely, the coast and protecting the coast and particularly in an era where we are, uh, I'll say, worried about what's happening with storms and losses and uh, severity of storms and the frequency of the hurricanes. It's something that uh, uh, the membership should definitely keep an eye on. Uh, there's a slew of other TWIA bills out there that do little tweaks to the board's uh, governing structure. Um, there's some TWIA biennial recommendations that are part of uh, some bills that are going to be heard soon. I don't think there's, as I recall, anything controversial about TWIA's biennial recommendations. Uh, no, I think they were, they, some of them were biennial recommendations from last session. I think even that just didn't, didn't make it all the way. Okay. So um, I, I think the big one is really just the funding. Um, the funding structure, the governing board, um, Trying to keep that representation there. TWIA is up for a sunset review by the uh, Sunset Commission in 2025, along with the Department of Insurance. And uh, again, a term we throw around, sunset review. And uh, that a civic lesson on sunset review. <laughs> civic lesson on sunset. That does not mean sit on your back porch or patio and watch the sun go down. That is a good sunset <laughs> review. This is completely different. Uh, so state agencies are subject to a review to see, I'm trying to, as I remember learning this years ago, to see if the agency should quote sunset should be uh, done away with. Now, it's rare that that happens. Um, uh, I happened to end up being involved in one of those when the agency was was, <laughs> was shut down and restarted. It wasn't my fault. I came in afterwards to, to help start the uh, new organization, but uh, it's a good process where agencies, you know, the Sunset Commission, uh, which is composed of public members, uh, House uh, members, and Senate uh, members will review and determine, you know, is the agency fulfilling its purpose? Uh, are there changes needed to the agency's uh, authority, a governing statute? Uh, and so there'll be a lot of discussion uh, heading into 2025 about 
squeal, regardless of what happens, uh, passes or doesn't pass this session. Um, right. And, and that so will be, and that ultimately results in a, a bill. So next session, there'll be a big piece of legislation to, as Albert said, probably continue the Department of Insurance and TWIA and um, those. And so um, it does, having a big piece of legislation like that and negotiating all the parts, it does open it up to all sorts of ideas and things. So it'll be a big one. It'll be a big year, big session for, for insurance. Yeah. It will be, so uh, that would mean wait and see what happens, but definitely even after this session, we'll have more opportunity to talk about TWIA. Uh, every August when TWIA comes up for its um, rate filings, it has to file a rate or, or its rate decision, whether it's no change or, or raise rates or lower rates. It has to file that by August 15th of each year. Uh, so we'll have that happen again. That's always a big back and forth about TWIA rates. Um, uh, to sum it up real quickly, the argument is generally focused on the notion that TWIA rates have gone up a couple of times in the last few years, but you've got to have a wind policy plus a, a uh, your home policy plus a flood policy, depending on what uh, area you live in. So a lot of discussion about affordability. Um, but I, I just think it's, it's something our members hear about. Um, you know, the TWIA assessment, real quick, here's another quick civic lesson. <laughs> that that billion dollars is a portion amongst the companies, depending upon their percentage of writings here in the state. Uh, but those that percentage of writing can be reduced if you write uh, some coverage down in tier one, down in the TWIA area. So uh, TWIA puts out a percentage of participation report, usually in the summer, as I recall, mm -hmm. of each year that will outline, for example, if company A has 10%, of the market under the calculation that TWIA uses or 14%, then you will pay 10 or 14 or 0.2 or 5% or whatever it happens to be of that total assessment amount. So that's something also to be aware of and keep in mind. Uh, but we'll, we'll see how the session goes. We'll, we'll see if the notion of some sort of state uh, funding, whatever form it comes out to uh, is, feasible are going to pass and the surcharge notion, uh, if that can pass or is that uh, something that will be tabled this session, we'll see where that heads as well. It is, um, I think we pointed out the surcharge is, is up to a billion, but also to point out that that surcharge applies to, um, would apply at least in the bill is written to all fire and allied lines, farm and ranch uh, owners policies, um, residential property insurance and the property insurance portion of commercial multi parallel policy. It does not apply to auto. I think that question came up uh, quite often. So uh, we'll see what happens to it. Um, I think it's interesting that, you know, TWIA has gone where I've seen it go over the years from not getting a lot of attention and then Ike happened. Um, and then it started getting a lot more attention uh, because of the risk and the exposure uh, down the coast, but I know companies still write quite a bit. Uh, we're guesstimating at this point, we're trying to get updated numbers, but perhaps 55% uh, of the wind and hail is uh, written by the private market. So uh, beyond the interest of funding TWIA, it's uh, you know the policies that we cover down along the coast. So um, political hot potato, a lot of moving parts. Uh, uh, if you are an insurance nerd, TWIA is always of interest. Uh, there are multiple other states that have similar residual market programs uh, who operate either, well, mostly through assessments um, for most states. Uh, and so uh, I think it's going to be interesting to see where we end up. But that's, uh, I think that's, I could go on and on about TWIA having done it for right. quite a while, but <laughs> I think that's uh, that's in a nutshell kind of the big picture issue of what's the uh, view of what's going on with TWIA this session, some of the concerns, some of the discussions, even in the interim, some of the ongoing discussions. So uh, Angie, uh, when I am long gone and retired and um, sitting in my assisted living home mumbling <laughs> about TWIA, uh, you will probably still be working on TWIA. So good luck to you whenever <laughs> that happens.
has just passing the torch on. Yes, uh, <laughs> no, you're right. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, I think it, I think it definitely will be something that continues on. And what what's interesting about Twia is that you know really doesn't impact the you know the majority of the state. It's just those those 14 coastal counties. And so I think as citizens uh, of Texas uh, overall, we don't really think much about it. But it is something that's you know truly important to the coastal communities. But with that, you know, we've kind of talked about, you know, this mix of the private insurance, you know, private companies, uh, the insurance industry uh, and TWIA. And, um, you know, I, I don't know, maybe touch touch on that a little bit more about how how much the the state or the private insurance market actually covers the the state, the 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 coastal areas. Well, as we mentioned, uh, the private market, right, the majority of the wind and hail coverage, of what TWIA uh, can cover uh, along the coast. It depends on what county you're in. You're in, we're sometimes two to one in terms of being the majority rider in that particular, ca- particular county. And I think you're right, Rich, people don't think about TWIA if you don't live on the coast. Right. Um, and even if you're on the coast, you forget sometimes or don't think about that the private market is there and riding. Uh, insurance coverage, uh, and I know when I listen to the TWIA discussion, it's often talked about as TWIA is the only option um, down the coast. It is not. Uh, you actually have to get, here we go, getting into the weeds, but you have to get, um, uh, to get TWIA coverage, you have to be declined uh, two declinations from the private market right. um, to even get it. And so I, I know when we talk uh, and do discussions on the coast, there's often a reminder, there's a pri- there's companies here writing uh, wind and hail coverage. Um, you can get a policy here. I think, you know, the concern amongst the private market at times, uh, Rich, is that to compete with TWIA, um, that the private market rates will not be as low as TWIA rates are, not because, um, TWIA has uh, better underwriting or um, can price it cheaper. TWIA often ends up pricing it cheaper because of the nature of how they set their rates uh, and the politics that get involved with their rates. It goes back to the, right. It goes back to the um, not always operating the same way as an insurer with reserves and things like that. And And I think that that is because it's a, not a state agency, but especially the general public doesn't exactly know what it is. Sometimes it does get confused for maybe that it's supposed to be the cheaper option for people versus the only option as a residual market. That is, yeah. That's a good point, Angie. And, and if you listen to TWIA hearings uh, with the rate discussions and other hearings, uh, you'll often hear the concept that uh, TWIA should be cheaper. And TWIA mm-hmm. needs to grow. Um, well, as a residual market for the insurance folks out there, you know, a residual market's not supposed to grow. Uh, it's actually supposed to shrink over time. Um, and the private market should be the predominant market, wh- whatever, whether it's residual auto or residual home, fair plans, uh, TAPA or TWIA. And so TWIA sort of has a, there's a different mindset at times about it, that it should be bigger and it shouldn't be. Um, we should be working so that people don't have to go to the residual market, that they can uh, find coverage in the private market, but that coverage in the private market is going to be priced uh, appropriately based on the risk and the underwriting standards that the insurance companies have. So mm-hmm. it's it's really, uh, it's interesting a lot. Like I said, it, it's, it's at times complicated because the, the rhetoric and the perception of TWIA is not that I shouldn't be in this, I should be over the private market, the perception is the exact opposite. Um, That you need to keep TWIA prices low so that I can be in TWIA. Um, And that's counterintuitive for, you know, how we think that a residual market should work. So uh, a lot of work to do on TWIA. Uh, I know the industry has been, Angie said it, probably three years, I think when Angie started with, with us, we were already having discussions about how do we fund TWIA differently and how do we make it more sustainable uh, and how do we make it work better. So um, those those discussions will continue. Uh, and I think 
the private market will do what it can. And without again continuing too long, you know, we we know we had last year some some insolvencies from some of the Florida companies um, who wrote uh, some policies down along the coast, and that has also impacted TWIA because um, those companies have been involved in, in some of the depopulation uh, efforts with TWIA. And now that those companies went under, well, those those policies may end up back in TWIA. Um, and so that's going to trade additional pressure on TWIA with additional exposure. I think the last number we saw said TWIA had about $72 billion uh, in exposure and had, correct me if I'm wrong, Angie, had a little over $200 million in their catastrophe catastrophe reserve trust fund. So just, and that's, I'm not explaining everything that goes into the funding, but yes. if you just think about it in terms of there's 200 million plus sitting in their reserve fund. Um, about 187 million, 190, something like that. Uh, yeah. And they take in about 400 million a year in premium. Um, plus the number we threw out as their funding uh, one in 100 is about 5.2 billion, or at least proposed mm. this year, to be about 5.2 billion dollars. Well, think about that in relation to a 70 plus billion dollar exposure um, from a pure insurance, purely as an insurance person looking at that. That doesn't seem to make a lot of sense, uh, but from a residual market and how it operates here in Texas right now, that's what we have uh, in place. So that's one reason it's a really big discussion. Everybody understands, you know couple of big storms through here. Uh, we don't know what happens uh, and what the discussion would look like after. Well, this was a great discussion, very uh, informative. I think it was pretty robust there to cram all that into 30 minutes. Uh, Albert, Angie, thank you so much again for all the information and the discussion. Uh, for additional information, we usually have some stuff up on our website, insurancecouncil.org. Uh, Albert, Angie, thank you very much. And as for some housekeeping, again, check out insurancecouncil.org for all of our upcoming webinars. Uh, we have things on wildfire. We have uh, catastrophe modeling. Uh, and we'll probably do another one where we talk about issues like this that, that's going on in the legislature. So thank you so much uh, for joining us. This was ICT on PNC. This has been a production of the Insurance Council of Texas, Austin, Texas. All rights reserved. Copyright 2023.